thank you, Joao, and uh, it's really um, a pleasure and uh, an honor to be uh, to be with you and to be back here in uh, in Washington. To be honest, uh, I miss Washington, where I am now, <laughs> um, because there is also always an, an, a, a very impressive um, intellectual input when you come here to this uh, country and, uh, and this city in particular. And therefore, let me tell you uh, once again uh, the real pleasure I have in, in, in being here. Um, I think as, as Joao said, this is a, a unique opportunity uh, to um, exchange our experiences, the uh, U.S. experience, the uh, European Union experience in, in crisis response, in the whole issue about crisis management, starting with uh, trying to prevent conflicts from going on right up to uh, the post-conflict um, situation. And I would like really to thank all those who made this happen, of course the EU delegation, and I think they did a great job, but also the different uh, think tanks that participate in that, the Center for Transatlantic Security Studies, uh, the CSIS, the Brookings, and the John Hopkins School. Um, the, this conference, as Joao will say, comes at a very timely moment, and I think this is not a coincidence. It takes place before the uh, NATO Chicago summit, and uh, I really hope that you will go back home with uh, a clearer understanding of uh, where the EU uh, actually stands with regard to crisis rep response. And uh, if ever you have a better understanding of that, please let me know and share it with me. Uh, that would be a very valuable contribution. But I think it's also, uh, um, this uh, conference would also be about uh, learning and exploring how and where best to work together and uh, leave it to others maybe also to respond to that. Um, as you know, um, just a quick word about where we are today. The EU has deployed thousands of staff in civilian and military operation for the last 10 years. Uh, sometimes we disagree on the figures, but it's more or less 24 operations, I think, that we have launched in the last 10 years. Uh, and uh, this, these operations have spread um, all over three continents. Um, and uh, uh, quite often including staff coming from non-EU countries, which is maybe one of the most interesting assets of, uh, of uh, our efforts. Uh, countries like uh, China, Russia, uh, and others have been part of this. And uh, if I can welcome Congressman. How are you? Um, and um, of course, we tend to see the EU as a sort of unique actor, uh, as our toolbox of instruments spans all over a, a wide range of, of possible intervention. It's the famous three Ds that you have heard too much about, I guess, diplomacy, development, and defense. Uh, but I think the real important thing there, uh, under the uh, new command of the high representative, thanks to the Lisbon Treaty, is that this uh, span is, um, for one, a, a really valuable contribution as it goes, in my opinion, and that's the most interesting, through the whole stages of what is and can be a crisis, starting with trying to prevent it from happening through mediation up to diplomatic uh, contacts and diplomatic initiatives, then to the uh, crisis response itself, and then to the uh, development assistance in the post-conflict and all the financial instruments that our colleagues from the Commission can immediately mobilize. Uh, of course, the US has similar capabilities, and I think we have to be aware of that. Uh, uh, and even, let's admit, that these capabilities are much more developed than ours, and uh, with a much longer history and, and experience. As I was telling before, we only started 10 years ago. But um, I think that since the last 10 years, we have developed also a, an experience at our scale, at our level. And I hope that today what will be interesting is to share that experience together and to see, to a large extent, I think, uh, that we are facing today similar challenges, whether it be um, how to do more with less because of our financial constraints, how to ensure coordination between the different agencies, uh, 
how to speed up procedures and be more flexible. I'll come back to that in a few, in a few seconds. What I really wanted to say is the following, around two or three observations. The first one, as uh, Joao mentioned that briefly, is that things have changed with the Lisbon Treaty, but I'm not so sure that we have all understood what are the huge implications of this Lisbon Treaty. It's not only about setting up a new, uh, not a new institution, in fact, a new administration, the EAS, under the chairmanship of, uh, of Cathy Ashton, it is uh, about launching and promoting this comprehensive approach I was um, talking about uh, a, a little minute ago. Because this new uh, administration brings about immediately um, new, uh, a new way of looking at things, putting this administration much more into the, um, the, the natural flow of the everyday daily uh, management of events as they are unfolding. Uh, and forcing all the institution and also the member states to adopt new attitudes. And I think one of the problems we're facing today in Brussels is that altogether the all of us have maybe not understood exactly the whole scale and the magnitude of what is going on. It was all very well dealing with CSDP operation when they were done in their own nice space um, where you could work in a sort of autonomous way than it is today when we are facing a crisis to bring about around the table not only the different elements of the SDP sectors but also services from the Commission in the humanitarian field, in the development field, bringing the geographical departments from the EES, the um, management team in charge of crisis response and trying to work all together, blending our different experience and working in the same way. Suddenly you have a new need, a new urgency for speed, for flexibility, for adapting if we want to move ahead with some CSDP operation, adapting it to the ground as it is going on, and also, uh, let's put it that way, asking also member states to forget sometimes some of their own interests and to try to work all together in a more speedy and flexible way. Let me give you just one or two examples and you will understand immediately what is happening at the moment in the Sahel, in Mali. We are right at the moment in the middle of a major crisis that we had all foreseen to some extent and to be honest that we were all hoping to prevent um, as uh, events were unfolding in Libya. Um, and as we had launched rather successfully a whole Sahel strategy with clear commitments to work with the different countries of the region and we are at the moment in the process of setting up a new CSDP operation with Niger, mostly dealing with security sector reform, uh, uh, assistance to the uh, uh, state building in Niger and here we are with a major crisis popping up in the neighbor uh, Mali half of the territory being now invaded by uh, uh, either uh, Tuareg movements or more dangerous movements from the uh, Salafi uh, uh, move. Uh, and uh, we need to react and adapt ourselves very quickly to that because we're taking diplomatic contacts with the Mali government. We're having very close contacts with the ECOWAS, a regional organization, as you know. They're talking about military operation. They're asking for diplomatic and, and assistance and uh, development assistance. And we have to uh, reorganize our whole machinery to be able to adapt to that. And of course, in a system like the EU, which is not, I would say, the most uh, speedy um, bureaucracy in, in, in the world, this puts, uh, under, this puts the whole administration and the whole system under a lot of strain. And this is where we are at the moment and this is where we have a lot of work to do. This is, um, doesn't mean that we are not accepting that responsibility. But that means, of course, that we have to make choices. And we have to make choices because we're facing, I think, today, as we all know, um, two new uh, very um, important um, uh, features. The first one, of course, is the, um, the new uh, strategic um, um, context. Um, we're here in a country that is uh, very much looking at this. Uh, your guidance on defense have recently uh, put a new emphasis on 
Asia and other regions of the world. And of course, for the Europeans, there is a real need to adapt themselves and update themselves to this new reality. And then, of course, there's the financial crisis that's putting a lot of uh, financial constraints on us and forcing us to um, uh, adapt uh, our whole um, defense system in each and every one of our countries to this uh, new reality. Of course, we are taking the necessary measures. And as you know, with regard to um, capacities, there has been a, a work going on. Claude France Arnaud will tell you much more about this, I'm sure, later on. We have been working very closely with NATO. Uh, we call it pooling and sharing. NATO calls it smart defense or interconnected forces. And I think it's going in the right direction. But here again, let's be honest, there are major questions that are still ahead of us and to which we need to um, pay some attention. Um, how far are the Europeans ready to go towards a process of uh, planning our defense um, expenditures uh, as we move on? Do we have the right industrial, technological research bases in order to uh, have these new capacities? What about defining new standards and European standards? How do we eventually, between ourselves, try to specialize ourselves in, uh, among member states in such and such new technology? All these are the questions looming ahead of us and they are still uh, very difficult to answer. But of course, apart from, from uh, the whole question of capacities, it's also the whole process of CSDP, the new reality that we're facing there, where we need to put uh, a new momentum. And it's all about this, giving a new impulse to a whole system as this uh, CSDP sector is now becoming more and more coordinated with the rest of, um, of, the, um, of the, uh, the rest of the EEAS. I won't go too much into that because I give you an example with Mali. I could give you a lot of other examples with what we are doing at the moment in the Horn of Africa. What we will have to do, I think also in the months ahead with Sudan and South Sudan, where we are also planning a new, um, a new CSDP operation. And I could go on like that, even with uh, what's happening in the um, Arab world, think about Yemen and think maybe tomorrow about Syria. What I think, and I will end on these notes, on these few observations, is that if we're looking for a new um, momentum and maybe changing and bringing more um, flexibility in our whole system, I think we need to do it on a very pragmatic base. This has always been the great value of Europe. You know, let's not kid ourselves and try to pretend that uh, CS, the European CSDP um, uh, has um, always got its act together, that it has no shortcomings. We know that it is a long, pragmatic, gradual, progressive process that it will need time. And let's be honest also about the fact that looking at the goal that we're trying to pursue and the strategy that we're trying to pursue, as always with the European, there are strong differences of view. We are not all the 27 of us on the same line with what we're looking as the future goal of the CSDP. That's why I think more than ever, this is the way we did with uh, the single uh, European markets, that's the way we did it with the Euro, that's the way we're doing it also with the foreign policy, that's the way we should do it also with defense and security. It's about being pragmatic, moving gradually, and making a step-by-step -step approach. It's also, secondly, being more realistic and knowing very clearly where we are today and the major challenges that we're facing also. And thirdly, I think, and I would like maybe to emphasize this, it's about also having a stronger clarity of purpose, knowing better what we want. In most of the crises we're facing today, and that strikes me a lot as we're moving on, think about Syria, think in the last days about Libya, or today about Mali and Sahel, we're very much there on the spot, um, with now strong network of EU delegations that are playing a major role and that are really a success, 
but we lack still at the moment a little bit more assertiveness about really the kind of goals we want to reach, the kind of policy and political goals we want to move forward. And I think there, as we move on, the ES must be more self-asserted and quite ready to speak um, its own mind as, uh, as we move along. So at the end of the day, what all this is really about, it's about a capacity to deliver, of course. Um, and quite too often we have been criticized for that, I think uh, unfairly, because if you look at the track record of the, uh, of, uh, the European Union, just once again, think about what we're doing at the moment in the Horn of Africa, starting with uh, uh, a direct fight against piracy, then going for training the Somalian troops, now building the maritime regional capacities as we move on. I think we have managed there uh, to launch a full-fledged operation that is being really um, a very impressive uh, uh, operation. So I think this is the kind of challenge we're facing ahead. And just to end on a final and maybe controversial note, I think that all this proves only one thing, is that this uh, very famous controversy about soft power or hard power, about uh, Venus versus March, Mars, sorry, um, I think this has become somewhat a bit irrelevant as we're moving ahead. And it's much more about now, as I was saying, having um, a, foreign, a European foreign and security policy that will be able to be efficient, uh, flexible, uh, and up-to-date.